I'm satisfied with just a cottage below, a little silver and a little gold. But in that city, where the rain will shine, I want a gold one that's silver. According to surveys, death is our fifth greatest fear. It follows public speaking and embarrassing yourself publicly. Admittedly, a public speaking is tough and chances are real good you will embarrass yourself. But you will absolutely say something you did not mean in a time you did not mean it. You will choose the wrong word or words. You will embarrass yourself. But public speaking and embarrassing ourselves should not surpass our fear of death. If men don't fear death, it is simply because they don't understand it. Death ends our opportunity to accept God's grace. Death ends our chance to be washed in the blood of the Lamb. Death ends our hope to hear the Spirit's invitation to come. Death brings with it the threat of eternal damnation to everyone who dies without Jesus, 2 Thessalonians 1, 7 through 9. Therefore, it is unreasonable and uninformed to fear anything other than death if you don't have Jesus. It remains a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God, Hebrews 10, 31. If one has not obeyed the gospel of Jesus Christ, he should not eat or sleep. He should not tarry or delay. He should use all his resources to, to seek the Lord and find him. For if death gets to him before he gets to Jesus, the combined vocabulary of humanity cannot adequately describe the state. Tonight, to not fear death is to not understand it. Death is the door that leads to eternal joy and eternal torment, Luke 16, 19 through 31. Death is the gate that leads to eternal judgment. Hebrews 9, 27, the Bible says, And as it is appointed unto man once to die, but after this, the judgment. Death is the river that brings us to joys of eternity. Where we will hear, well done, good and faithful servant, or depart from me, I never knew you. Death is the hallway that leads to the courtroom of God where we will stand before the judgment seat of Christ and receive judgment for those things we have done in our bodies, 2 Corinthians 5.10. Death is when our time living on earth ends and our time in eternity begins, where in eternity it has no end. But to, but to understand death tonight, we first must understand life. If you remember in the account in John chapter 11, uh, there we read about how Lazarus is dead. And by the time Jesus gets there, he had been dead for quite some time. So what does it mean to live? Every, de of, every definition of death has this concept. It is the contemplation of life. That's what many say. Webster defines this as the quality that distinguishes the vital functional being of a dead body. Life is not simply physical, but also the eternal. God is described as being from everlasting to everlasting. John wrote in John 1 verse 14, Jesus, uh, and more or less, is the God-man. In him was life, and that life was the life of me. Life originates with God, and that eternal life took upon flesh. John was stated this way in John 1 verse 1, that which from the beginning, 1 John 1 verse 1, that which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, and our hands have handled the word of life. What the Bible then teaches us tonight is that life comes from life and of the same kind. And since God is a spirit, John 4 verse 24, and we are his offspring, Acts 17, 29, we then are the spirits being housed in these physical shells. Life ultimately teaches us what death is, and that's the way Scripture describes it. Scripture's definition of death, we don't have to wonder about it, because James, through inspiration records, 
Uh, James chapter 2 there, he talks about word, then he talks about faith, how words give life to faith, and so the Spirit gives life to the body. The reverse is also true. Uh, James says, without faith, faith without words is dead. He says in James 2, the body without the Spirit is dead. In James 2, verse 25 and 26, there James is going to use Rahab as an illustration. James says, likewise also was not Rahab the harlot justified by works when she received the messengers and sent them away. For as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead also. With regards to death, when a human being's spirit departs, departs from the body, the result is death. Those who remain are left with the body, the spirit is gone back to God. There are two ways of understanding this in scripture, and this process occurs. The first is found in Genesis 35, 16 through 19, where the Bible says, here you have Rachel given birth. And the Bible says in Genesis 35, verse 16, and as they journeyed from Bethel, and there was but a little way to come to Ephraim. And Rachel travailed, and she had hard labor. And it came to pass, when she was in hard labor, that the midwife said unto her, Fear not, thou shalt have this son also. And it came to pass, as her soul was departed, for she died. And she called his name Benoni, for the father called his name Benjamin. And Rachel died and was buried in Ephraim, which is Bethlehem. Jacob and those who were left were left with the body, so they buried it. Her soul, listen to this expression, her soul was in the party before she died. And that's what James says in James 2, the body without the spirit is dead. The reverse is also seen in Luke chapter 8, beginning with verse 51. There the Bible says, and when he came into the house, and the father and the mother of that maiden and all wept, and bewailed her, but she said, Weep not, she is not dead, but sleeping. And they laughed him to scorn, knowing that she was dead. And he put them all out, took her by the hand, and called, saying, Maid, arise. And her spirit came again. And she arose straightway, and he commanded to give her meat. If the body without the spirit is dead, then the spirit brought back into the body has to be life. James' words are true and shown in both directions. Now, unlike Jesus, no one today can call someone's spirit back in their body, though many claim to do that. And so when the spirit departs from the body, the Bible's definition of that is death. But what about the origin of death? Where did death begin? Death introduction is seen in the garden. Death is connected to sin. In fact, those two are forever linked to each other. Paul explained it this way in Romans 5 verse 12. There he says, Wherefore, as by one man, sin entered into the world, and death passed upon all men, for all men have sinned. Paul wrote in another place in 1 Corinthians 15 verse 24, For in Adam all die. Paul does not mean that we inherit Adam's sin. Truth of the matter is, no one can inherit someone else's sin. Sin is something we do. It is something we commit. It is not something we inherit, Ezekiel 18. It would also, that would truly give great difficulty to our Lord being born of a woman, Galatians 4, verse 4, and yet him doing no sin, 1 Peter 2, 22. We don't inherit Adam's sin, neither do we inherit what many have called this sin nature. Many speak of Adam and death and say we have fallen, we have a fallen of nature. Again, biblically speaking, that's not true. The nature of man is the same before, during, and after his encounter in the garden. The way we see it is the same. James 1, uh, James 1, 13 through 15, the avenues through which come to us, 1 John 2, 15 through 17. That's how Adam and Eve sin. Man is the same after, as he was before the fact. And if you just change the object, you'll see what Adam done, others had done. For Adam and Eve, it was a piece of fruit, Genesis 3. For Achan, it was clothes and money, Joshua 6 and 7. For David, it was a woman, 2 Samuel 11. 
Each one sinned the exact same way. In fact, if you go and say Adam sinned, creating a fallen nature, then every person after him will have this fallen nature. But here's a question. If that's true from everybody after Adam, how did Adam sin? If the fallen nature began after him, explain him. What the text says in Romans 5 verse 12 is death passed upon all men, not sin passed upon all men. As a result of that, we have two options. The death that passed upon all men can either be spiritual death or physical death. God told Adam and Eve about death in Genesis 2 verse 15. There the Bible says, and the Lord God took man and put him in the garden of Eden to dress him and to keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat, but of the true, but of the tree of knowledge and good and evil thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. Now again, according to Romans 5, verse 12, the Bible says, Death passed upon all men. True for the matter is tonight, we don't have a choice in that. Adam and Eve's actions are shown. Uh, show me their understanding of what God said. Uh, their reaction is to hide. Again, the Bible says, because they are afraid, but of what? The word die in this verse simply means to die. To have one killed, to be executed. Uh, there is nothing figurative in this verse. The trees are real, the birds are real, the, rent, the wind is real, all is real. James' definition of faith is God's definition of faith in the garden of Genesis 3. Adam wouldn't have known of the spiritual death. He would have only known of the physical death. He's not afraid of being put out of the garden for he does not know that punishment yet. What he was afraid of is being separated from God and God putting him out. What he is afraid of is the punishment of God. You eat of this tree and you will die. Thought he was going to die, he was afraid, and humanity has forever been changed. Everyone has always understood what death is. It's precisely because we understand it. We don't think of spiritual death, uh, it has such significance. When we leave the scene in the garden, all reality is forever altered. For now, as humanity, as humans, we now know what death is. We understand God's death of spiritual language because we understand the physical first. We come to understand what spiritual adultery is in Ezekiel 16 because we know what marriage and unfaithfulness is. The same is true of death. When John wrote, cast him into the lake of fire, which is the second death of Revelation 20, 14 and 15. We are concerned about that because we understand what the first death is. Uh, there, then there is another phrase where he talks about in Ephesians 2 verse 1, dead and in trespasses and sins. It's not physical, and neither is it spiritual. Now, at least in my estimation tonight, it's somewhere between the two. Again, Paul says in Ephesians 2, verse 1, And you have a quickened who are dead in trespasses and sins. In Luke 15, 24, the Bible says, My son was dead, and now he is alive. In 1 Timothy 5, verse 6, But she that liveth in pleasure is dead while she liveth three expressions, but two dead. Death number one, when we talk about James, the body without the spirit, there's one death. Then there are those who are dead in sin, yet they are still alive physically. And they have an opportunity to repent. These people are asleep to righteousness, Colossians 2 verse 13. Yet they have an opportunity to be awakened and be quickened by the gospel. Now the people of which... Uh, he talks about in Revelation, they have no such hope. Revelation 2, verse 11. John, with all the texts of the Bible before him, 65 books, John wrote the last. He talks about 22 different deaths. The Bible says in Revelation 20, verse 14, And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire, which is the second death. In Revelation 21, 8, 21, 8, but the fearful, the unbelieving, the abominable, the murderers, the whoremongers, the sorcerers, all those people shall have their part in the lake of fire, which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. The second death is spiritual death, eternally so, and thus is a result of not having Christ when the first death comes. But if you have not yielded to Jesus when death comes, 
I have to tell you tonight, church, death is coming. You will be lost eternally so. In preaching on death, I love to kind of illustrate it. So I want you to use your imagination with me tonight as well. I want you to personify death with me. What do you mean? I want you to imagine, if you would, that death had life. Death was an actual person. Here's what you should know about death. As far as manners are concerned, death doesn't have any. He never comes at a convenient time, for there is no convenient time for him to come. No family is ever ready, and every time he shows up, we always say, I wish I had a little more time to make this right. Which brings us to the second thing. Death is rude and offers no compassion. Death shows up and forces his way into our lives. He comes despite our desires. He shows no concern for our bargains. He offers no comfort to our pain. He is relentless and unyielding. He pushes his way into our lives, disrupts them, and departs as quickly as he came. Death attacks are persistent. After bursting into our lives uninvited, he leaves and leaves us to deal with the pain that he has caused. Like a tsunami or a tornado, he destroys everything in his past. And after the fear and the panic and the damage, he leaves us to deal with the aftermath. The hurt comes, the hurt continues long after the loss. No apologies, nothing but pain. A numbing in a morning that leads to a plane, the pain that has no remedy, and it might last for a lifetime. Death is indiscriminate. In a world that seeks advantages, there are none when death comes. Death has no favor. He offered no exceptions. Death cannot be bought. He likes the rich and the famous, well as the poor and the unknown. Death takes male and females, every ethnicity, every culture. Death takes the young, the old, some parents don't get to leave the hospitals with their babies because death came. Hard to imagine the pain. Can you imagine death as a warrior? If death were the enemy approaching the shores of humanity, what would we do? Better yet, what could we do? We would have but one solution, to surrender. We would know of his coming, but we wouldn't know when. We would know of his power. We would know that he has left so much pain and so much agony in his path. And we would know that one day he's coming for us. It's the reason death has occupied the minds of men since his introduction to us. I have to tell you, church, his past uh, successes, they are impressive. As humans, we have our mighty men and women uh, who have conquered. Uh, they continue to erect monuments and statues, uh, demonstrating and commemorating their greatness. We are all forced to deal with one indisputable fact. Death has conquered them all. History teaches us one loud and persistent lesson. Death is the undefeated, undisputed conqueror of humanity. No matter how long we live, one man almost lived to be a thousand years old, and he died. Alexander was called the Great. Go ahead, throw that, go, go ahead and put that at the end of your name. Not lawyer, but the Great. Who are you? I am the Great. Said to have conquered the world, but he died. No matter how much you learn, all the great minds throughout history, they all died. No matter how mighty a man is, David had his mighty men, but you know what? They all died. Samson picked up bars and he died. No matter how much wealth a man has, Solomon, Steve Jobs, Michael Jackson, they all died. Every ethical, every culture, every ethnicity, those who are big and small, those who are here like Absalom, bold and shy, daring and fearful, famous and, inf and, 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 and infamous, all our heroes, all our mighty men, death has defeated them all. Death scores everything. Solomon went on a search for meaning and fulfillment. He kept running into death. Solomon searched for meaning under the sun, and the book of Ecclesiastes records his search. The king kept running into death, eventually leading him to this conclusion. Vanity of vanity, said the preacher, all is vanity. When you read the book of Ecclesiastes, at times his reflections on death seem like a concession speech. To everything there is a season, 
and a time and a purpose under the heaven, a time to be born. You can almost see the king saying this, and a time to die. Eventually, Solomon acknowledged death's power and sway and realized even a man with divinely given wisdom and enormous estate and riches without number, having power over a kingdom, there is nothing you can do when death comes. Solomon went so far to say there is no man, no man that had the power over the spirit to retain the spirit. Neither hath any power in the day of death, and there is no discharge in his war. And church, I submit to you tonight that Solomon was right. History had told him to say, the past only confirmed the accuracy of his observation. There is nothing we can do to stop death. Death was like a tyrant destroying a nation. Someone needed to stand up. Death was like an outlaw menacing humanity towns. A sheriff was needed. Death had no rival and humanity had no answer. And so what do we do? We cried out to God and God heard our plea. God said, how am I going to stop this death from putting fear in the hearts of my people? Solomon had well, had well summed up humanity's interaction with death when he said, no man had the power to retain the spirit in the day of death. Death had to be the most proudest warrior ever. The most proudest warrior history had ever known. He was undefeated and undisputed. But you know what, church? Solomon didn't know Jesus. Christ came to earth to defeat death. The world was made flesh, John 1 verse 14. Solomon said, no man, but Jesus is not just a man. Jesus is the God man. His name will be Emmanuel, which means God is with us. Christ's birth brought peace on earth and goodwill toward men. Can you imagine death's attitude toward that? Heaven and earth would be the way of Jesus. The shepherds were alerted by the angels, and the birth of Jesus was announced a multitude of the heavenly hosts, saying, Peace on earth, goodwill toward men. Can you imagine what death said when he heard that? Death brought men fear, but now men would know peace. Christ was not afraid of death. In fact, he spoke as if he were more powerful than death. Christ was not afraid of death. No man had ever spoken about death like Jesus. And that's true of death. Nobody spoke about death the way Jesus did. But Jesus wasn't afraid of death. In fact, again, he spoke as if he, more, as if he were more powerful than death. Consider what the Bible says in John 10. Christ touching his death on one occasion said this. Therefore doth my father love me because I lay down my life and I might take it up again. No man taketh it from me, but I lay it down of myself. I have the power to lay it down. I have the power to take it up again. This commandment have I received from my Father, which is in heaven. Death must have heard it. He heard men speak of their abilities before, talking about how great they were. But his record was perfect. Now he's hearing that same boast again. This one with a slightly different twist. This one was claiming that he was more powerful than death. He had power to lay it down and he had power to take it up again. Imagine what death said when he heard that. Of all the great people who said how great they were, of all the people who spoke as if they were more powerful than death, death said, I have conquered all of them. And so the challenge was joined. Death accepted it. The crowds Jesus attracted must have made him upset. The chance people made of his Messiahship must have upset death. As the passion the last week of our Lord's life progressed, death must have taken a particular delight in what was taking place. One of the Lord's apostles betrayed him, death must have said good. The Pharisees at last arrested him, got him under their control, good. The trials he endured, the beatings, the mockings, another friend denied even knowing the man. The rest of the world, those that were close to him, they left. The Romans beat him, mocked him, scourged him, condemned him, and eventually he was nailed to the cross. Hoisted in the air, suspended between two thieves. And at last, Jesus died. The hope of the world. 
the Messiah, the Son of God, is dead. Can't you tonight just imagine that in your mind, the attitude of death? Here you have this man walking around talking about how great he was, but I've conquered him and I've conquered everyone before him as well. From Adam to Calvary, no death could have been sweeter. If death had ever been challenged, now he was certain not even the God man had power over death. And death must have rejoiced. But it speaks to the mind of God because, at least in my estimation, it has to be the greatest irony in human history. One, neither the devil nor death could have foreseen that God would be born of a woman, that he would take upon flesh so that he could die just to defeat death. The Hebrews writer explained it this way in Hebrews 2 verse 14. For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, Jesus himself likewise took part of the same. That through death he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is the devil. And deliver him who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject unto bondage. It's difficult to imagine what death must have thought the day the Messiah died. Try to imagine it if you can tonight. Jesus woke up in eternity. Woke up in the Hadean realm. And day one of our Lord went by. Death must have walked through Hades proud. I can imagine there was a boast in the beating of the chest. Bragging about how great he was. Bragging about how he had power over the God man. Day two in the grave. Death must have floated. But can you imagine the stir in Hades on day three? As Jesus began making his way to the exit, death had never seen a day like this before. The one who said, I have power to lay it down, I have power to take it up again, he made good on his promise. Maybe the devil tried to prevent it, but I can hear Peter saying it was not possible for him to be holding of it. The king arose from the dead and death knew his terror was over. He was never, after all, all powerful. That description belongs to God. He was never worthy or fear like he thought he was. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, Proverbs 1. His hold on those before Christ was gone, and those who will follow Christ, we would never have to fear death again. In fact, when death shows up now, what death demonstrates now is the utter futility of human wisdom, church. When your loved one dies and the pain is gripping you and your friends and your family, when it's your time to get the call, the news, and you're sitting there weeping and sobbing, no one says, call me a philosopher. Nobody says, get me one of those evolutionists. Nobody says, call the scientist. Nobody says, get me the humanist. Nobody says, get me a mystic. When death comes now, everything and everybody is speechless to help. Nobody wants to hear from anybody, and the philosophies of men can't do a thing about it. But when death comes now, it's as if Jesus takes heaven's megaphone and he screams to all of humanity, I am Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, which was and which is the Almighty. And I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man goes to the Father except by me. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. But because of Jesus, what he's done, when death shows up in the life of a Christian, we talk different now. We don't run. We aren't fearful. We don't hide away. Christians say things like this. I know whom I have believed in, and I am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. Christians say things like, for the which cause we faint not. Though the younger man perish, yet the younger man is renewed day by day. 
Christians say things like, Bless me the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with all spiritual blessings in Christ. Christians say things like, For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Death, like nothing else, demonstrates the power of Christ. The necessity of being in Christ and the joys and the comfort that he brings. Only Christians say, blessed are the dead which die in the Lord. A study of death doesn't seem complete to stop at death. Because of Jesus, what Paul says seems to fit again. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible shall put on incorruption, and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. Paul says, But thanks be to God that giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. The good news tonight is Christ rose and death has been defeated. Death is coming. Make no doubt about it tonight. You need to get to Jesus before death gets to you. There was an illustration I enjoy using. I'm sure many of you have heard it before. Uh, there were a father and a son having a conversation. The father was pretty much asking his son what he was going to do with his life. He said, well, I guess I'm going to go to college. I guess I'm going to graduate. The father looked at him and said, well, and then what? I guess I'll get married and have children. Then what? He eventually said, well, I guess I'll die. And his father asked him one more time, then what? I don't know what kind of life we're living on this side of life on earth. I don't know what your intentions are. I don't know why you think you're here. I don't know why, what you think you're trying to accomplish. But let me ask you this. After you leave earth, then what? If you don't know the answer to then what tonight, you need to get to Jesus. What are you going to do about death, about sin, about the judgment? What we have to suffer here again is temporal and light, 2 Corinthians 4, 16 and 18. Heaven is assured because of Jesus if we live faithfully. The resurrection is certain, but everything is going to be all right because of Jesus. For the child of God tonight, death has no power, but as humanity, as his children, we have all hope. We are God's children. We don't have to fear death. We don't have to be afraid of the judgment, because if we live our lives faithful to what God has to say, we can go to heaven. If you're not a child of God tonight, we encourage you to be one. Again, death is coming. We know it's coming. There are many who did not wake up today. There are many who started this year who would not end this year with us. Death got them. But what about you tonight? Here you have an opportunity to respond to the gospel by hearing the word of God, believing of what you've heard, repenting of your sins, confessing him, and being baptized for the forgiveness of your sins. Then Jesus will add you to his church. Acts 2 verse 47. And the Bible says in 1 John 1 verse 9, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We encourage you tonight, whatever your needs are, please come while we stand and sing. What can wash away my sins? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is a flow that Nothing.